I want to begin by thanking the organisers for giving me the opportunity to present some of our work on molecular modelling of supercapacitor systems. As we shall see, supercapacitors are examples of energy systems which are driven by a solid fluid interface. In the case of supercapacitors, the electrolyte electrode interfaces. Other examples of fluid solid interfaces are mineral fluid interfaces underground that are relevant to oil recovery and carbon sequestration. Electrode electrolyte interfaces in batteries as well as supercapacitors. Reactive fluid solid interfaces relevant in, for example, heterogeneous catalysis and the absorbate adsorbent interface in absorption that leads to energy efficient separations. In all these cases, the interfacial phenomena driving the energy application takes place within a few nanometers of the interface. And for two decades, as part of two large US Department of Energy projects, I have been working with experimentalists and other computational researchers to understand these phenomena. Most recently, since 2009, I have been part of the Fluid Interface Reaction Structure and Transport, or FIRST Center, which is a Department of Energy, Energy Frontier Research Center. Supercapacitors are energy storage devices that, like regular capacitors, consist of two electrodes and an electrolyte. The schematic is shown on the top right hand corner of this slide. Supercapacitors have electrodes that are nanoporous to increase the surface area for ion absorption and thus increase the energy stored by orders of magnitude. Charges are stored by physical absorption into electrical double layers within the electrodes and so supercapacitors are also called electrical, electrical double layer capacitors or EDL capacitors. Compared to batteries, supercapacitors store energy rapidly since the underlying phenomena does not involve a chemical reaction. Hence, supercapacitors have high power density. The Rigoni plot on the bottom right hand corner of the uh, slide is a log log plot of power density on the vertical axis versus energy density on the horizontal axis. Batteries, shown in red, have high energy density but low power density due to the time taken to charge or discharge the battery. Supercapacitors, shown in blue, have lower energy density than batteries but higher power density. The goal of the first center is to increase energy density of supercapacitors to make them competitive with batteries. Likewise battery researchers are working to increase the power density of batteries which would lead to faster charging which is highly desirable in for example electrical electric vehicle applications. Supercapacitors have long lifetimes. They can be cycled millions of times while batteries are typically limited to about a thousand times due to degradation of the electrode. Since supercapacitors do not react chemically with the electrode, it does not degrade them. Supercapacitors have a much wider operating temperature than batteries. All of these characteristics are the result of the energy storage mechanism being based on physical absorption of ions into electrodes. This is also the reason for the primary limitation of supercapacitors, moderate energy density. So how can we improve the energy density of supercapacitors? Consider this equation for the energy stored in a supercapacitor. The energy density of a supercapacitor is given by the specific area of the electrode A multiplied by the specific capacitance C and the applied potential V. The maximum value that V can be is determined by the electrochemical stability limit of the electrolyte i.e. the potential beyond which the electrolyte decomposes. The power density is the energy density divided by the charge discharge time which for supercapacitors is of the order of one second. Based on these equations the strategies for improving supercapacity energy density are to increase the electrode surface area this is why we use nanoporous electrodes to enhance the capacitance which is a function of both electrode and electrolyte to increase the voltage, which is voltage V, which is primarily a function of the electrolyte since it means using an electrolyte with higher electrochemical stability. To improve power density, we need to enhance transport properties and reduce transport times. Often the question reduces to how can we improve energy density without compromising power density? To do this means exploring new electro electrolytes and electrodes, 
and to reach fundamental understanding of the electrical double layers in supercapacitors, which is the goal of the first center research. The electrolytes we have studied in the first center include aqueous electrolytes, which have many positive properties, uh, but are limited in electrochemical stability to plus or minus one volt due to the water. This leads to replacing water by polar organic solvents, such as ethylene carbonate, which have better electrochemical stability, plus or minus 2.5 volts approximately, but at higher cost. Another approach which has been pursued by many researchers recently is to use neat room temperature ionic liquids so that there is no solvent in the electrolyte. These have high electrochemical stability, approximately plus or minus 4 volts, and wider operating temperatures, but also higher cost and can be highly viscous, thus reducing power density. Since there are so many possible room temperature ionic liquids that could be synthesized, the hope is that there are room temperature ionic liquids with the ideal characteristics for supercapacitor performance. Note that recently very high concentration electrolytes, known as water and salt electrolytes, have been, have been shown to have much higher electrochemical stability, renewing interest in aqueous electrolytes uh, for supercapacitor and battery applications. In the first center, we pursue an approach that we call model integrated synthesis characterization and experiment. And in this figure, we show the temporal the, along the horizontal axis and spatial along the vertical axis, uh, the uh, temporal and spatial scales accessible to different computational methods shown as rectangles. This is a very typical figure for a computational researcher to present. Each of the computational methods shown is used within the first center. Superimposed on this are ellipsoids that show the time and length scales in the available experimental methods used in the center. By the design from the very beginning of the center, when we developed a version of this diagram for the original proposal, we ch have chosen experimental probes that in many cases overlap in both time and space with the computational approaches, or overlap in spatial resolution. This confluence of scales enables two important things, validation of computational approaches by experiment and understanding of experimental results through modeling. Note that neutron scattering methods, inelastic neutron scattering, INS, quasi-elastic neutron scatter scattering, QUENS, and neutron spin echo uh, spectroscopy, NSES, probe much the, of the same spat spatio-temporal scales as classical molecular dynamics. One of the keys to success in the first center has been the way in which computational experimental researchers have, re have agreed to work on systems that are amenable to modeling. This means in some cases simplifying the geometries of the electrode electrolyte systems uh, in, into the kinds of simplified geometries that are shown in this uh, figure here. And so our experimental colleagues have synthesized electrode materials that mimic these simplified geometries, including carbide-derived carbons, uh, which have well-characterized pores synthesized at Drexel, ordered mesoporous carbons, OMCs, and disordered mesoporous carbons, DMCs, synthesized at Oak Ridge National Lab, and onion-like carbons uh, synthesized at uh, Drexel. One of the exciting materials discovered at Drexel by Yuri Gagotsi and co-workers as part of First Center research are maxines, which are layered two-dimensional materials consisting of transition metals, that's the M in maxines, interleaved with layers of carbon or nitrogen, that's the X. Since these are entirely new materials, we in the theory group of FIRST have had to build up computational models for these materials uh, from FIRST principles. Uh, in this talk, I want to focus on computational predictions. Molecular simulation is primarily used to interpret experiments and or provide molecular insight that then can be used to infer the development of new materials or systems. Within the first center, we have striven to make computational approaches lead experiment by predicting phenomena that are then confirmed experimentally. Within a 15-minute talk, I don't have the time to go into more than one example in depth, but I will point to one of our early examples one of our early successes, I should say. Inspired by the experiments of Yuri Gagossi and Patrice Simon, showing that carbide-derived carbons with e mem tfsi ionic liquid electrolyte exhibit a peak in capacity as a function of carbide-derived carbon pore size at 0.7 nanometers, 
we performed molecular dynamic stimulations that confirmed this peak, provided mechanistic, mechanistic understanding of its origin, and additionally predicted the presence of peaks at pore size of 1.4 nanometers and higher. This computational prediction was reported in the paper by Guang Feng, shown here. This prediction was finally confirmed five years later in the paper by Zhu Hang Wong and co-workers. A review of the computational research in the first center up until 2017 is provided in the Advanced Science Review article uh, given here on this slide. As noted earlier, one of the disadvantages of neat room temperature ionic liquids as electrolytes is that they can be quite viscous, and this proves to be a problem as far as transport properties are concerned. One strategy for overcoming this is to dissolve the ionic liquid in an organic solvent. Even qualitatively, it is clear that the ions in the organic solvent, in the video at the right, have much higher mobility or diffusivity than the ions in the neat ionic liquid, uh, shown in the video at left. Thus, we uh, have interest in uh, the first center in the use of organic solvents with ionic liquids to improve their transport properties. We first performed a combined uh, quasi-elastic neutron scattering plus molecular dynamics studies of the ionic liquid BMIM TF2N, BMIM bistriflate, dissolved in four organic solvents, measuring the diffusivity of the BMIM cation via quens. The four solvents shown in the figure at left were acetonitrile, methanol, tetrahydrofuran, and dichloromethane. The BMIM diffusivity measured by Quenz was found to increase with solvent dipole moment, as shown in the figure at left. The diffusivity of BMIM was found to increase dramatically in going from neat ionic liquid on the right hand side of the figure on the right to 25 weight percent solution. Uh, in fact, this is about a, a, a two order of magnitude increase in diffusivity. The molecular dynamic simulations reproduced the same trends and also suggested that the dipole moment of the solvent was enabling higher diffusivity by screening the iron-iron interactions, leading to shorter iron association terms. However, this was a limited study of uh, BMIM bistriflate in four solvents at four concentrations. So this uh, begged the question, how do these conclusions hold up if we study many more solvents and many more concentrations? So we did this computationally um, um, using what's known as the Molecular Simulation and Design Framework, or MOSDEF. In a separate, in this MOSDEF project, we have been building an open source software infra infra infrastructure called MOSDEF, or the Molecular Simulation Design Program pro, uh, Framework, that automates many of the steps in molecular simulation, including building a system and applying a force field. Uh, this is done with MBuild and FOIA respectively. Everything is scriptable. And so when you combine this with SINYAC, an open source workflow management system, it enables screening calculations to be, form, to be performed on uh, soft matter systems in a way that is completely re reproducible by other researchers. More information about this is available at uh, mosdef.org. So uh, using MOSDEF, we, pe we perform molecular dynamics-based screening calculations using 22 different organic solvents listed in, uh, uh, to the right of the figure in the, this slide at 18 different compositions of BMIM TFSI for a total of 396 distinct systems. In this figure, the BMIM diffusivity is plotted as a function of ionic liquid mass, mass fraction in the 22 solvents, each identified by color coding. Note that the plot is log-linear, with the diffusi diffusivity in some solvents, for example acetonitrile, differing by two orders of magnitude over the concentration range from dilute at the left of the graph to concentrated at the right. All of the curves uh, come together at one point at mass fraction one since at mass fraction of one since this corresponds to neat uh, BMIM TFSI. With this much larger data set, how does diffusivity depending on solvent polarity look as we concluded from the more limited Quens and MD study? This figure suggests there is no correlation with uh, solvent uh, dipole moment. In this figure, 
the beam-m diffusivity is plotted as a function of solvent polarity. Each vertical line of points corresponds to a solvent and the points to different compositions. That is, each line contains 18 points ranging from the lowest concentration at the top to neat ionic liquid at the bottom, which is shown as a dashed line. However, if we plot the results versus solvent diffusivity, we see that there is good correlation. For dilute solutions, this is not entirely unexpected, since on the basis of Stokes-Einstein, we would expect for a dilute solution in a solvent that uh, solute diffusivity would be inversely proportion, proportional to solvent viscosity. And then since solvent viscosity is inversely related to diffusivity, this would suggest that solute diffusivity is proportional to solvent diffusivity in the dilute regime. The simulation data suggests that this is true well beyond the dilute regime. Inspired by our calculations, First Center collaborators from Ames National Lab used the pulse field gradient NMR to measure the diffusivity of the BMM cation in 10 of the solvents we studied computationally. In these figures, the diffusivity from simulation is plotted as a function of the experimentally measured diffusivity for 10 solvents, shown as colored symbols, and at ionic liquid mass fractions of 0.1 at the left, 0.2 in the middle, and 0.6 at right. Points lying on the at y equals x line indicated excellent agreement between simulation and experiment. Quite remarkably, for 8 out of the 10 solvents, the MD simulations were spot on. Only for adiponitrile and diglime were the simula simulations off, uh, and this is probably due to inadequacies in the force field in the simulations. Using the experimental data only, but clearly supported by the simulations, these graphs show BMM diffusivity uh, versus the solvent diffusivity for the 10 solvents at different ionic liquid mass fractions. Strikingly, these results suggested that for 80% of the solvents, the BMIM cation diffusivity is one half that of the solvent, uh, the exceptions being octanol and adiponitrile. This important heuristic, namely that BMIM cation uh, diffusivity is uh, approximately half of the solvent, uh, as a means for choosing an organic solvent began with purely computational predictions and so is another example of computational research leading uh, experimental work. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the people that we've worked with and the, um, the support of the Department of Energy and the NERSE Supercomputing Center of the Department of Energy where we do most of our calculations and these are the people from Vanderbilt who are contributors to MOSDEF uh, we uh, have now seven other universities directly involved with MOSDEF development funded by a la na large National Science Foundation grant. I'll be happy to take questions.